All right. Testing, testing, testing. Can you hear me? Well, good morning, everyone. It is so good to see you. Welcome back from any trips or, or vacations or holidays you were taking this summer. So good to see everyone. I could hardly tear myself away from the conversation. It is good to be with you in the house of the Lord. Amen? Good. Well, thank you, Emily, for that wonderful prelude. Um, I just have a couple things from your bulletins. If you didn't get one of these, they are back there. Um, these bulletins have a lot of helpful information to get connected with our church. There's my number in there. There's Roger's number in there. Um, please, please, please feel free to reach out to us. Our elders want to be elders who love you and know you. And so if you need a prayer request, if you need to talk about something, call us. Uh, reach out to the prayer chain. We are here to serve, and it is a good joy to be a part of the body of Christ. Um, on that uh, next page in, there's just a bunch of things going on. And actually, Wendy is going to come up and give an announcement for one of them. Let's see. Can I do wireless mic? Test, test. All right. So, is, it is this one on? Nope. How about red? Can I do red? I can do this. Oh. <laughs> Actually, I, oh, I was going to say I can just use my teacher voice. Um, okay, so last week I made a big goof in the bulletin and was trying to call all the ladies in the church to let them know that there wasn't Bible study this last Thursday. Thank you for your patience. And now this week there's a goof too, but it's Yes, I contacted him about the movie night. It says it's Tuesday, September 17th. It is Friday, September 27th. So, yeah, so. My fault. Yeah. And, but the thing I want to talk to you about is this Wednesday we're having a game night. Usually I've done, la or not me, but we've done ladies things. This is for ladies and gentlemen, and young ladies and young gentlemen. And so we're going to be playing Bible bingo. I bought it, and you know how it usually says B-I-N-G-O in numbers? This has like poets, prophets, Paul's letters, and then it has, a, anyway, but it will, it'll be okay. I looked at it, and I think I can figure it out, so you'll be good. The other thing we're going to play is Bible Pictionary, where you're drawing things like Jesus walking on the water. We'll play these games for maybe about an hour, then we're going to make a, you get to make your own ice cream uh, sundae. And I'm bringing Dad's root beer, too, in case you want to make a root beer float. So I hope you're able to come. We'll see you Wednesday at 6. Oh, and if younger kids come, their parents can just help them figure out where to put the bingo stuff. They, yeah, you'll be good. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, Wendy. Sounds like a fun time. Uh, and I, I can't promise you that any of your uh, stick figures walking on water won't make it into the bulletin the next week. But, you know, come, come have a good time with us. There's some good things happening in September. So there's that game night, that ice cream social, and then a busy weekend, Friday, September 27th, and Saturday, September 28th. We have the movie night. There's nothing much more like a family than getting together and watching a movie. I've been mentioning that we're going to watch the animated Pilgrim's Progress. It has a lot to offer and a lot to take away from, both for little kids and for adults, as we all uh, meditate on the journey that we are on as, as Christians and the, the debt and the burden that has been removed from us at Calvary. And a good time, a good movie. Um, we do ask if you want to come to that movie night. Anyone can come to the movie night, but if you want to eat pizza right? And you know you want to eat pizza. Please, please RSVP so we can know how many pizzas to get, and that'll be a fun time. Followed by Cowboy Church, Saturday, September 28th. Uh, we did that last month. We had a great turnout. It was a great outreach to folks in Woodburn. Uh, if you want to put on your cowboy shoes and your cowboy hat with me and, and worship the Lord and um, hear a message from God's Word, that's uh, something that we're doing to reach out to that community in that area. And uh, we, we'd love to have you come join us. Yeehaw. Yeehaw is right. All right, well, I'm going to have Tim, one of our elders, come and begin our time with a reading from God's Word. Good morning. Good morning. 
Bravo. I'm going to be I'm going to be reading uh, Psalms one. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the river of water that brings forth its fruit in its seasons, whose leaf also not wither. And whatever he does prospers. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind blows away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in judgment, in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the ways of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord, that we can gather together, that we can hear your word preached, and I pray that you would use those words to, to touch people's hearts, especially if they don't know you as their own Lord and Savior. I pray this day that you would use this word to reach them and that through that they might be saved. We just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Please stand with us as we sing our first song.
Thank you, worship team. At this point, we're going to dismiss our young ones to uh, uh, Children's Church and the fun and the learning that await them. That's right, bring your Bibles. Woo, yeah, go. Psh, psh. Psh, one for you, psh, one for you. Good, come on up. Good, let's lift them up in prayer. Lord, we praise you for the gift of our little ones, and we pray that you would lead them to yourself and reveal yourself to them through your word, that your words would be heard and understood, not as the words of man, but as the words of God, that we would hear them and obey them, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Feel free to sit or stand, whichever you're more comfortable doing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind.
are the broken, you are the healer, Jesus Redeemer, mighty to Well, thank you again, worship team, for leading us in song. That was powerful. I can't imagine what it'll be like when we all stand face to face before King Jesus, before his throne, singing his praises together. That's, that's going to be awesome. Well, I invite you to continue our time of worship in awe of who God is by opening up your Bibles to John chapter 7. We'll be in John chapter 7, verses 14 through 18. Originally, uh, we were going to have a longer passage today, but I chopped it in half. So, you're welcome. <laughs> John seven fourteen through 18. And uh, as we're turning there, I'm just going to give us a brief context. Last week, we saw Jesus as uh, people are beginning to desert him. His message is beginning to become unpopular. Um, he goes up to the Feast of Booze. It was a, a week-long feast celebrating the, the deliverance of Israel out of Egypt in the wilderness as they're living in tents. Um, this feast is happening approximately six months before the last Passover. So Jesus has about six months left to do his Father's work. And he's proclaiming in the temple his words. His brothers wanted him to go up publicly with fanfare, that time has not yet come. Jesus goes up privately and he is seeking to draw people to himself as he proclaims who he is. Let's prepare our hearts in another word of prayer. Father, with your word open before us, we pray that you would lead us into green pastures that you would guide us beside still waters and, and feed your sheep. It's, it's for you that we're here, Lord. It's for your name, for your glory. We want to praise you because you are holy, 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 and you are worthy of the highest praises. God, I just pray that you would comfort our hearts as we come before your word this morning. 
that you would be with those of us who are hurting, who are wounded, who are sick or dealing with pain, who are anxious, stressed, who are stuck in guilt and shame. God, we pray that you would give us rest as we come to you, that you would fill us with rivers of living water from your word, that you would cleanse us from all unrighteousness and bring us close to your side. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The word of the Lord comes to you today from uh, John 7, 14 through 18. You're welcome to stand or take a, a reverent posture, however you want. This is the word of God. About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, How is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. Amen. You may be seated. As we look at our text today, we see how Jesus speaks boldly about his message and his mission when his teaching is questioned in the temple. And we're going to see for ourselves that these words that Jesus says, though short, are packed And they're worthy of our meditation as we meditate on Jesus' words so that we can model him both in his devotion to God and his devotion to God's word and in his uh, method of, of witnessing. We need to model his devotion and his witness ourselves. First, in these first few verses, in verse 14 and 15, we're going to see the context as John transitions us to this next part of the story. Again, this is smack in the middle of the same story. So Jesus is ridiculed by his brothers. Hey, if you do these works, why don't you go up to Judea? That's where all the people are. That's where all your disciples are. Many of the disciples that just left Jesus because of the hard words of chapter 6. If you do these things, go show yourself to the world. They're expecting a Messiah to save them from Rome, to make Israel great again, to throw off Roman uh, persecution and to give free bread and healing and wonders and and to have a new messianic age as as Israel is thriving with a, a leader that gives them what they want physically, but not necessarily spiritually. And we see that Jesus is not uh, accepting the bait. He's not uh, following the the, um, advice of his brothers. He is on his father's timeline. Uh, My time has not yet come. And so he, he goes up to the feast. He doesn't lie about it, but he doesn't go up in the way that his brothers are wanting him to go up. And everybody's coming into Jerusalem. Everybody would be seeing whose cousins and neighbors and friends are there. Oh, hey, you're there. It's a big kind of a pilgrimage thing. And so they're looking for Jesus. Where is Jesus? But they don't see him. And we see in verses 12 and 13 that the people are kind of divided about him. Some people are saying he's a good man. Some people are saying he's leading the people astray. But nobody can find him. They're looking for him, and he's not there. Jesus verse 14, sneaks up, I say sneak, tongue-in-cheek, in about the middle of the feast. People don't know where he is, but in the middle of the feast, he, he appears publicly in the temple, and he begins teaching. So as John sets up this next encounter with the Jews and Jesus' answer, uh, Jesus is now teaching in the middle of the feast in the temple, um, and he's doing this, as he's already told us in John, because his food is to do the will of him who sent him. In chapter 5, we saw that the son can do nothing on his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. And so Jesus goes up, he's, he's teaching, he's following his father's timeline. And in response to Jesus' action, the Jews are marveling at his teaching. His teaching is powerful, 
His teaching has authority, not like the scribes and the Pharisees who are always referring back to different um, fathers of the Jews and their writings and their authority, their interpretations. It would be like somebody always referring back to commentaries and Jesus is speaking the words of God straight from Scripture himself, from, from his lips with his own authority. And so they're marveling at this, at his teaching, but... Even in their marveling, John already tells us in the context that there's some division here. There's much muttering among the Jews. Some people think that he's a good man. Some people think that he's leading the people astray. But they marvel at his teaching and they say, how is it that this guy has learning when he's never studied? What authority does he teach from? Why should we trust in his teaching? And Jesus, as he responds in verses 16 and following, responds with a set of three contrasts, three statements that contrast something from something else. And he gives us the answers to the question, how should we approach, discern, and share God's words? So we're going to look at these contrasts that he gives as he answers the Jews How is it that this man has learning? What is it about his teaching that we should trust? How do we know that his words are true and are God's words? How should we approach, discern, and share God's words? Well, the first contrast that Jesus gives is in verse 16, and that is that we need to recognize the source. In verse 16, Jesus answered them saying, My teaching is not mine but it is his who sent me. The contrast that he makes is that, hey, this is not me. This is not my authority. Yes, I'm, I'm speaking as one who has authority, not referencing these Jewish commentaries or these fathers and their, their opinions, but I'm, I'm speaking as one speaking the words of God, but my message, my words, my teaching, it's not me. I am speaking his words who sent me. Jesus testifies that the source of his teaching is not his, but is God's. And as we look, I just want to share with you guys, if you're not familiar with the layout of John, uh, I already told you we're six months away from the last Passover, from the crucifixion. And John spends the most amount of time covering those last few moments of Jesus um, from chapter 13 onward as Jesus focuses on his disciples in the upper room and um, on, on his death and his resurrection. So we have from now in chapter 7 until the end of chapter 12. And in chapter 12, you can flip here, or I'm just going to read it for you, the last public words that Jesus says to the crowds, to the Jews, to the masses, are found at the end of chapter 12, right before John takes us to the upper room where he focuses on his disciples. In John 12, 44, it says this, And Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. Uh, Skipping to verse 49. For I have not spoken on my own authority, But the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. I include that just to emphasize that Jesus' whole ministry, his whole preaching career over these last three years, if you want to call it a career, his message has been proclaiming God's words, proclaiming what God has sent him to speak and to do, only what God has sent him to speak and to do, and nothing else. And the message that God is proclaiming is that whoever believes on the Son Whoever looks to him will have eternal life, will be saved from death. And it's, it's through belief, looking on the Son and having faith in him is the road to eternal life. That is the message that Jesus is proclaiming, and he emphasizes, these are God's words. They're not mine. They're not Joe Schmoes down the street. 
They're not just uh, the opinion of a man. These words come from God. As the scriptures later say, all scripture is breathed out by God, as if God breathed it out himself. And he used humans and, and he wrote it down, but these words given to us are as if God had them come out of his mouth on his breath himself. And Jesus emphasizes that. My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. Just a couple thoughts as we think about this and in terms of how we relate to God and his word and how we model the way that Jesus witnesses to others about God and his word. First of all, there should, nothing, there should be nothing new about our message. And that's kind of difficult. Humans thrive off of new things especially those of us who have smartphones, right? We're always looking for something new, some new kind of information. It's an endless scroll. It's actually something in your brain. Uh, I don't know. I'm not an expert about it, but it's actually something in your brain. You got to believe me that it sparks the, the dopamine or whatever that you want to have new things, new information, and you're always looking for new excitement, new peaks. And um, there's nothing new about the Christian message. That's difficult because we live in a world that hungers for new things in which the old is not good enough. But we stand on the solid rock of the Word of God that has been the Word of God for ages. The, the problem that the church faces today is that the church, in facing an unpopular message, just like Jesus is losing followers because of an unpopular message, the church tries to spice up the Word, to spice up God's message to spice up these things by making it new or different or uh, departing from the words of Scripture. And that's a very big danger. We stand on the solid rock of the words of God. And there is really nothing new about the Christian message because if I were to tell you something of, hey, look, you've never heard this before, this is new, and this is awesome, that would be dangerous ground, right? Because I am departing from Scripture and saying something apart from it on my own authority. But Jesus says, my words are not new. They are not mine. They are his. They are the, the living and active words of God. As a song Roger sometimes has us sing in church, ancient words, ever true, changing me and changing you. As I think about how we should approach God's word, I think about how we need to be reverent and submissive to the words of God. We need to recognize that as we approach the Bible, that these words are not the words merely of a collection of men. They are not merely human tradition or opinions, but these are God's words. So when I come to my quiet time with Jesus, when I come to crack open my Bible, my heart should be in a place of of uh, flexibility. God mold me and shape me. And I'll tell you firsthand, that's hard. There are some things in this book that are hard to hear, hard to stomach, not popular in the eyes of this world. But if I come to Jesus as a, as a piece of clay saying, God, this is your standard, your mold, your word, and I want to change to it, God, would you change me according to your word? Like a man gazing into a mirror and being conformed from one image to another, we look into the word of God, and it's a dangerous business. Just disclaimer, it's a dangerous business if you look into God's word with that kind of heart, because having a heart submissive and reverent to God's words you're not going to come away unscathed, unchanged. You will be different. Just like if I can throw in a Lord of the Rings example, uh, Gandalf says to Bilbo as he's thinking about going on the quest, can you promise that I will come back, Gandalf? No, I can't promise that you come back. But if you do come back, you won't be the same. I invite you to go on a journey with the Lord in his word. But no that you may not be the same. The word needs to change us. And Jesus has this view of scripture 
this teaching is not mine, it is God's. And I, even Jesus says this, I am, am subordinate, I am submissive to this word that needs to change me. Secondly, I think that as we uh, approach, discern, and share God's words, not only do we need to have this attitude about Scripture, but we need to be able to witness to other people with this attitude of Scripture. Are we willing to proclaim and to stand on these words? When you share with people in the streets, in your neighborhoods, in your family, thus says the Lord, it is written this is what God says in his word. You're going to get flack for it. You're going to be scorned for it. You're going to be hated for it. But are you willing to stand there? Because these words, they're not my opinion, which I could be convinced to back away from if the heat got hot enough. It's not just the popular opinion that if you put a gun to my head, I would forsake and say, you know what? Nope, I don't want any part of that. These are God's words. And I will stand on them, come what may. Unfortunately, we live in the world in which don't shoot the messenger doesn't necessarily work for the Christian faith and message. If you stand on the words of God and give his message, they may well want to shoot the messenger because they hated him and they hate you because of Jesus in you. But we need to ask ourselves, in my faith, personally, and in my witness, am I really willing to stand on these words, to sit under these words, to let them change me, to let them be proclaimed without being ashamed of them? Well, there's a second contrast, a second answer. How should we approach, discern, and share God's words? Secondly, we need to cultivate our hearts. Verse 17, if anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. Again, Jesus continues off of this, this theme, recognizing the source. My heart needs to be in a place of acceptance and of moldability to the word of God. And that's part of the reason why the Jews are having a hard time discerning God's words is because they don't meet Jesus' conditional statement. Verse 17, if, conditional statement, if anyone's will is to do God's will, implied, then he will be able to discern, a contrast, whether this is the, the speaking of a man or whether this is the, the words of God, whether this is God's words or whether this is just me on my own authority, alone and uh, unsupported from Scripture. Jesus testifies to the heart behind his teaching. And the heart behind his teaching is a heart that is fitted and molded and, and moldable, malleable to God. My will is subordinate, submissive. I recognize that his words are the words of God, and I want to do his will. The trouble with that is that we often get it backwards, right? I want to do my will and what I want to do and what seems to please me and what's comfortable and convenient for me. And sometimes we face the danger of when we go to God's words or when we hear God's words, we filter what we read and we filter what we hear based on what I want to do. Yeah, you know, that preacher, he's kind of crazy and uh, I'm going to take what he says with a grain of salt because he's just crazy. Or, or maybe that's word from Scripture. This is hard. There's Christians who disagree with this and have a different interpretation. I'm just going to and uh, choose to ignore that passage of Scripture. But Jesus says, if your heart is in a place where you desire, you hunger, you long to do God's will, then you're going to have the ability to discern between God's words and between the words of men. We read this uh, passage in Sunday school. I just want to read it briefly to you. Uh, spoiler alert in John chapter 10. Excuse me, John chapter 10. 
Jesus talks to the Jews. He's in an ongoing conversation with them, and he, he compares himself to a shepherd. He says, I have told you my words, John 10, 25, and you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name, they bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. This passage is rich, and it's, it's got a lot there, and I'm so great, grateful that the Lord calls us by name and gives us the ability to respond and holds us in his hand. For right now, I'm kind of focusing on our part of the bargain, our action in the deal, where we hear his voice. Again, he makes us alive, but we hear his voice and we respond. And Jesus says that the heart that is there the prerequisite heart to be able to discern God's words is to have a heart that desires to do the will of God, that is open to hear God's words. Jesus gave an illustration about this when he gave the parable of the soils. So I'll give you a Jesus illustration. The, a sower went out to sow, right? Seed went all, all over on all different types of ground, hard ground, thorny ground, shallow ground, but it was the soil that was rich and deep and tilled and soft and ready to receive. I'm not a farmer. Many of you guys are farmers, but we know that you have to work the ground to keep it, to prepare it, that there's a special kind of soil that is able to receive and to multiply a hundredfold. And that soil is the picture of the human heart. What does your heart look like? Is your heart a heart that is moldable, soft, rich soil, able to receive God's word and multiply it, make it grow in fruits of obedience and repentance. As I think about applying this, this point, I think about, again, two aspects, my devotion, my approach to God's word, and my witness. I need to hear God's words, and I need to respond to them. That is the chief application of this passage. The Jews, they hear Jesus' words, and they don't know whether or not to accept them. As you hear them, John is writing so that you would hear the words of Jesus and that you would accept them. And first and foremost, I need to have a heart that is conformed not to my will, but to the will of God. Am I open to hear his words? Does my heart hunger for righteousness? Do I long to have his will be done on earth as it is in heaven? And perhaps another good question to ask is, am I able to discern God's words? Am I able to hear and to tell between God's truth and false teaching? You don't have to be a perfect expert theologian, but if God is in you, you will be able to discern these are God's words and these are not. And the, the prerequisite there is the heart, cultivating the heart. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know. And that's my prayer for us, that we would know. And a second level of application, there's also our witness. Jesus is crying out, come, come. Anyone who thirsts, come to the water. We're going to see him cry that out at the last day of the feast. But he's crying out to the Jews and giving them an answer to their question about Jesus' words, about his teaching. And something that we can glean from Jesus' method of evangelism, if you will, is that Jesus trusts in his Father's power. He's proclaiming his words to people who do not believe and who in a few days, or excuse me, a few months, are going to cry out, crucify him, crucify him. And Jesus' confidence is rooted in this verse as well. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether this teaching is my teaching or is the teaching of God. As he witnesses, he doesn't put the, the stress on himself of, I have to convince you. I open up your mouth and I'm going to cram the Bible in there, right? It's not my eloquence or my persuasiveness 
or my bodaciousness that's going to convince you to hear the words of life and respond. It's your heart. And whether God is drawing your heart, whether you are his sheep, and if you are hearing his voice and responding. So I think something that's really encouraging and comforting for us is not only should we prepare our hearts to come to the word and receive there the food that God has for us, whether you like it or not, but we also need to prepare our hearts in the, the call that God gives us to share the words of the gospel with friends, with family, with neighbors, with people out there that we don't know, because they might scorn you, they might cuss you out, they might ridicule you, your friends, your family, those are the ones that hurt the worst, isn't it? These people that you know, and they ridicule you for your faith in Jesus, but your job is to speak the words of life so that they have an opportunity to hear the voice of the shepherd. And your job is not to win them of your own power. That's God's job. Your job is to be faithful to speak, to be faithful to receive the scorn back. And I think a good question for us is, are we willing to do that? Are we willing to stand in God's strength, not in my own? Because if I'm just going to confess, I, I care about this community, I care about the lost, and sometimes I can work myself into a, a tizzy, trying to do and to accomplish, and I have to rest. God, you know your sheep, and I'm going to be faithful to bring the message, but you need to call your sheep. As we come to another answer that Jesus gives, the third contrast, how should we approach, discern, and share God's words. Well, we should recognize the source. We should cultivate the heart. But Jesus is moving now to this third point as he talks about this motive. Am I doing this from my strength? Am I doing this in God's strength? And he says in verse 18, essentially, that we need to moderate our motives. In verse 18, he says, the one who speaks on his own authority, apart from Scripture on his own, seeks his own glory. But the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true and there is no falsehood. The contrast here in this last one is the different people. The one who speaks on his own or the one who speaks seeking his father's glory. The one who sent him. And there's a difference. The one who speaks out of his own strength, out of his own power to make a name for himself um, is alone, is isolated, and is limited to his own strength. You might be pretty persuasive, you might be a good salesman, but you're limited to your own human finite strength versus the one who doesn't speak for his own name or for his own glory or reputation, but speaks for his name and his glory and his reputation. That person receives the power and the authority of the one he speaks for. Does that make sense? So Jesus, lastly, he testifies to the motive behind his teaching. And he says, I am not speaking these words in the middle of the Feast of Booze in the temple so that I can make a, a great name for myself. Jesus himself is speaking God's words so that he can make a name for his Father. And I think back again to John 5. We've already seen Jesus says, I can do nothing on my own. I seek to do nothing on my own. And I think that's a good sentence, a good phrase that ought to describe us, right? In the, the things that you do, in the, the way that you live your life, in the way that you seek to obey God, chiefly the way that you seek to read God's word and the way that you seek to share God's word with others. Are you seeking to do it on your own? Or are you seeking to do it for him? Resting in his power and his strength, what's the motive here? Paul attests that it's quite possible to proclaim the name of Jesus for selfish ambition. Look how good I am at sharing the gospel. I don't know if there's any one of you that might want to say that. I think most of us would be like, yeah, I really suck at this, right? But that's always a temptation there when you do step up when you are faithful and when there is fruit 
Sometimes we can forget that we depended on God for every step of the way and that the fruit we received was not our fruit that I worked for, but that's God's fruit that he worked through me. And what a blessing that is. Sometimes our heads can get real puffed up. Oh man, I went out into town and I shared the gospel and these people responded. Isn't that great? Isn't I, aren't I great? But Jesus says our motive must always be to seek the glory of him who sent us. Sometimes that means that for his glory, I will put my neck out on a limb and say something hard that I know I'm going to get flack for. And you guys heard me last week. I'm not talking about being rude to earn myself persecution, right? I'm not just going to say, hey, you're going to hell, and I'm going to smack you with my Bible as I tell you. I'm going to tell you the truth and the hard message that, that we are sinners and that we're stuck in our sin and that we need Jesus, and I'm going to tell it as lovingly as I can. But sometimes you're going to come face to face with a situation in which you're going to be hated for the right answer that you cannot shy away from if you're going to be faithful to Jesus. When the world looks you in the face and says, is it right to do this? What does the Bible say about this? Is this sin? Is this the only way to heaven? And you will need to say in a loving, gracious, compassionate way, Yes, that's exactly what God's word says. And you can hate me, you can scorn me, you can call me whatever you want to call me, but I'm going to stand on what God's word says because I'm not doing it for me or for my reputation in the eyes of the world. I'm doing it for him and for the sake of his glory among all the nations. And frankly, that's a bigger motivation than your approval, right? That should be our motivation. And as we come to God's word ourselves, again, two levels of application for ourselves in our devotion and for our, our witness as we share to others. When I come to God's word, do I seek God's word as one who seeks the glory of God? Again, this is a little bit overlapping, but if I come to God's word saying, God, I don't just want to extract my feel-good message for today, right? This is not simply my little devotional half a verse for today that's going to make me feel good about my life, which sometimes is a temptation. We, we look to God like a genie in the sky who will give us what we want, that we're spiritual consumers, that we want God to make us feel good about ourselves. And that's a very self-focused way to approach God. But if we come to God's word and we say, God, I want your name to be magnified in my life, so change me, mold me, make me uncomfortable, do whatever it takes. I want to be proclaiming your name and your glory among all the earth. And that's my priority as I read my, my Bible, as I come to Scripture in my quiet time. That kind of motive not only is going to transform your Bible reading, but that kind of motive is going to ensure that you are approaching God's word, that you are responding to it, that you are receiving it, like the Jews are not. They are not hearing God's word. They are not responding to it. They are not receiving it because they don't have this motive. When I read, do I seek my glory or do I seek his glory? Secondly, at that second level of application, as not only I come to God's word myself, but as I look at how Jesus is witnessing here, how he is proclaiming to the Jews here. Jesus is standing on God's words. Hey, these are God's words. They're not mine. Don't shoot the messenger, but I'm willing to die as the messenger because these aren't my words. These are God's words. He's, he's trusting in God's method. God is going to save those whom he will. Those who hear, they are going to know that these are God's words. That's not my job. Lastly, Jesus says, I am speaking not for my own name, not for my own reputation. I am speaking for his glory, for his name. Again, a little redundant here, some overlap. But as I witness to people, am I doing it so that I can make a name for myself? So that I can say, look how many people I brought or how many affirmations and uh, uh, people accepting Jesus that I brought about? Or am I doing it for Jesus' glory alone? Because if I'm doing it for my glory, 
I'm going to do it when I want to. I'm going to do it where it's easy, and I'm going to do it where I probably have 100% chance of getting fruit. And probably that means that I'm not going to do it at all, <laughs> right? Because it's difficult, and because fruit doesn't just come guaranteed, and I'm going to make judgments for other people. That person, that person looks dirty and stinky, and yeah, they don't need the gospel. They probably wouldn't say yes anyway. I'm going to say no for them because I'm doing it for my glory. But if I'm speaking the words of life for God's glory, I may find myself obeying Jesus, following Jesus into some places where I didn't expect to go, into some situations that are highly uncomfortable but I'm going to speak as one who has peace that passes understanding. I'm going to love you, and I'm going to say the words of life no matter what you think about me because it's not, I don't care about what you think about me, right? I care about what God's glory is going to be proclaimed, what's going to happen for the sake of God's name. And I know that God will be glorified. Just as a side note, God says that the earth will be covered with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord like the waters cover the sea. Think about that. Do the waters cover the sea? Yes, the waters cover the sea. There will come a day when God is fully glorified by the works that you are doing that you don't necessarily see the fruit for. There will come a day when your obedience now will result to the praise and the honor of Jesus Christ at that day. And you don't get to see that fruit right now, but you do have God who is with you, who says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted in the heavens and in the earth through your act of obedience, through your stepping out on a limb to dangerously read God's word with a moldable heart or to dangerously share God's word with someone who needs to hear it. God will be glorified through your actions, and that's your motivation. That's why you do it. How we approach God's word devotionally ourselves, and how we speak God's word in our witness to others is really important it might just make the difference between whether we or others are able to rightly approach, discern, and share God's words as we recognize the source, as we cultivate the heart, as we moderate the motive. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. It's living, it's active, it pierces even to the depths of our hearts. And God, I pray that you would just help us to meditate on Jesus' words here, that you would help us to love your word and to have this same kind of confidence about your words as Jesus did. These Jews, they, they're not sure if they want to accept Jesus. A lot of his words are hard and, and not comfortable. But Jesus is willing to stand on your words because he leans on you. And we pray, God, that you would help us to lean on your words personally, that you would make us better students of your word, that you would help us to be unashamed as we share it with others, because we are the people who leans in your arms. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Feel free to stand with us as we sing this last song.
want to do God's will. If you come talk to me, I'd love to help you understand or get over doubts or find your faith in